My name is Sebastian Bell. I'm the executive director of the Maine Aquaculture Association. And my uh, role today is to moderate this session and to give you a kind of a 30,000 foot overview of the aquaculture sector. So let's start, and let's uh, start with uh, the kind of underlying fundamentals, as Peter Drucker would say. What's driving the emergence of aquaculture, uh, both globally and uh, nationally and locally? And it really boils down to resources and what's going on in the food sector right now. For those of you who are not in the food sector, some of the stuff you may not know, um, but we have kind of an emerging crisis coming at us, and it really boils down to basic resources. 87% of the world's aquifers are being pumped in excess of their recharge rates. We're losing roughly 100,000 acres of arable land a year globally, and that's principally to urbanization and salinization, and uh, world phosphate reserves at current usage levels and at current reserve levels run out in 2030. If you don't have phosphorus, the yields on your plants go down by roughly 30%, uh, depending on what plants you're talking about and what kind of soil conditions you're talking about. We will find more phosphorus. We will find more efficient ways to use water. Um, hopefully, we will stop uh, misusing our land. But the bottom line is uh, the projections for the demand of food worldwide are that we have to double food production by the year 2050. That's in my children's lifespan. Um, so that is a tremendous clash of supply and demand. And aquaculture is right in the middle uh, of those two areas. The reason that aquaculture is emerging as a sector is because it turns out that it's very efficient as a way to produce food. It's roughly 20% more efficient than producing protein on land if you're talking about energy conversion. Um, if you're talking about fresh water use, depending on what kind of aquaculture you're talking about, there are efficiencies there. So there are a lot of places in the world that are looking at aquaculture as a way to generate food and not increase the strain on the basic resources that we're using uh, in the food production cycle. This is kind of the, the, the short version of the status of aquaculture on a worldwide basis. It's currently the fastest growing food production method in the world. It's growing roughly 6 to 8% to 10% to depending on which year you look at on an annual basis. Uh, you compare that to terrestrial agriculture. Terrestrial agriculture has been growing at roughly 1.1% for the last uh, 15 years or so. And commercial fisheries have been essentially flat for the last 30 years. We grow a lot of different species worldwide, and that's because we're trying to figure out which ones work. We're still early on in the development cycle. And interestingly, more stuff is grown in freshwater from a protein point of view than in saltwater. And that's changing very rapidly because obviously freshwater is a limited resource. Aquaculture in the year 2014 grew more seafood than commercial fisheries. So that was the year that we turned the, the balance, if you will, and we began to produce more seafood from aquaculture worldwide than we did uh, wild fisheries. It represents roughly $166 billion in gross revenues, farm gate value. Uh, this is 2016 uh, numbers. And roughly 18, 19 million people are employed worldwide in aquaculture. In the US, it's a slightly different picture. We're relatively behind the world in, our, uh, in terms of our aquaculture development. We grow fewer mm -hmm. numbers of species. We have a very significant aquaculture production, which is a stock enhancement model. That's the model that's used in Alaska to produce uh, salmon for their, for their fisheries there. Roughly, depending on which fishery you talk about, anywhere from 40 to 60% of the salmon which are landed in Alaska are coming out of hatcheries. So it's a stock enhancement based system. We still grow more fish in freshwater in the US than in saltwater, and that's principally catfish and trout. Um, aquaculture, again, on any given year, satisfies between 2 and 5%. That's the highest it's ever been, 5% of the domestic demand for seafood in the United States. Roughly $1.3 billion in farm gate value and roughly 3,000 farms, but that is, I would argue, a very misleading figure. The USDA definition of a farm in the United States is anybody who is grossing $2,000 a year from their farm. Uh, so if you actually change those numbers and go to, say, $100,000 a year, uh, those numbers came, come way down. And that's part of the challenge, I think, that USDA has in tracking production, both in aquaculture, but also in areas like organic farming, uh, where that, that definition applies to organic farms as well. So direct employment, we don't know how many people are directly employed uh, in the United States right now. 
There is a census uh, going on right now by the USDA to try and get a sense of what those numbers are, but we don't have any accurate numbers for how many employees are on farms in the US. This is looking at the relationship in the protein market between seafood and aquaculture and other protein uh, sources in the marketplace. And it, it shows a very clear difference between other protein sources, animal protein sources in the marketplace. And for me as a farmer or as a farmer advocate, I look at this and say, on the one hand, that is, that's kind of depressing. On the other hand, it shows the opportunity we have. So we produce you know, anywhere from 80 to 100% of beef, chicken, pork, turkey. You look at seafood, we're producing roughly 5%, maybe if we're lucky, maybe as high as 10%, depending on who figures you talk about domestically. If you look at aquaculture, those figures are much lower. So that's an opportunity for us to increase our domestic production there. And indeed, those figures reflected themselves in the national security assessment a number of years ago, where seafood was identified as a national security risk for two reasons. One was the, the low percentage that we are producing domestically, and the other was the high percentage of imports that are coming into the country which are not inspected by FDA. And that was viewed as being a bioterrorism risk. Now, whether you agree with that or not, it's up, up to everybody, but uh, the reality is it, it was serious enough that it hit this national security assessment for the first time. So I'm gonna end by talking a little bit about Maine and then um, hand off to the panelists. In Maine, aquaculture collectively is the second most valuable fishery uh, in the state. Lobster obviously being the first, um, but if you look at aquaculture, it's the second most. Roughly $100 million in farm gate value on an annual basis uh, in the state. We grow 24 different species currently in the state and really only 11 of those are commercially grown. And the, and the core species that we grow commercially here in Maine are salmon, mussels, and oysters. Seaweed is coming on strong um, and there are other some smaller uh, species that are also beginning to, to start up. But uh, it's really the big three, salmon, mussels, and oysters, which generate most of the revenue and employ most of the people in the state. We have roughly 190 farms currently that are permitted in the state and an additional 200 to 250 which are permitted but are pre-revenue. That means that they have not uh, had a long enough time in their production cycle to actually be able to begin selling things. The interesting thing about that number is that really represents what the potential short-term to medium-term growth of the sector is in the state. And the reason for those uh, numbers I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. We lease from you, the citizens of the state of Maine, 1,450 acres roughly, and we pay an annual rent to you, the citizens of, of the state, to use those acres. That is roughly 200 acres smaller than the space inside the Rockport breakwater. So of those 1,450 acres, we're generating roughly $100 million, and we employ roughly 700, 750 uh, people on a full-time basis. We currently have a farm in every coastal county and uh, we do have freshwater farms. We used to have a farm in every uh, freshwater county as well. We've had a trout hatchery that was bought up by Poland Springs. They were bought up for their water. Uh, so we don't have a, 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 a hatchery or a farm in every uh, county in the state anymore. I wanna talk a little bit about those, those uh, pre-revenue uh, farms. This is a breakdown of the pre-revenue farms on a species basis. And what you see very clearly is the two lar largest areas of growth are oysters and sea vegetables. Each of those is, uh, represents what's called an LPA, a limited purpose aquaculture license. And if you add up the total acreage of all of those LPAs, it's only 5.5 acres. So you will hear sometimes uh, in the public discussion about this explosion of growth uh, in the aquaculture sector, but the reality is from an acreage point of view, it's relatively modest. Um, the good news is that those, many of those are being used to prospect for areas by new startup farmers. And so uh, our hope is that over time they will convert to full-scale commercial farms, but you won't see probably that number of 549 because many of those turn out to be areas that aren't good for aquaculture, that they, that they don't work very well. And that's the, that's the actual purpose of the LPA program is to prospect an area and find out whether it's a good area or a bad area. In terms of economic impact, these are numbers that were uh, come out of the last economic impact study that were done in the, in the state in 2016 by the University of Maine. Um, the study is a little problematic because it, it um, for uh, kind of crazy, quirky reasons, 
It tended to survey the pre-revenue companies at a little higher rate than the existing revenue companies. And so it's a little skewed, but these are the numbers for whatever they're worth. 80 to $100 million in farm gate value, 550 to 650. We know that that number is higher. We know that we're probably at least 700 full-time uh, people right now. 1,000 total jobs, including full-time and part-time labor income, economic impact. Interestingly, we did a member survey and asked people to identify all the companies that they buy goods and services from. And that uh, summed up to 480 different companies around the state and a few companies out of state that they're purchasing goods and services from. So um, it's not just the farmers, it's who they buy from, uh, who they're contracting with for goods and services. And interestingly, the economic impact of the sector has uh, tripled since 2007, since the prior economic impact uh, study. So I'm going to end with kind of three slides that talk about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly that I have learned about aquaculture over the years. Um, we are not growing widgets here. These are living animals. Um, they don't perform like a nut or a bolt. Um, and it's not a factory. Uh, you don't open the door and you don't produce 100,000 units on the first day you open the door. There is a growth cycle and they're living animals and people sometimes tend to forget that. Your inventory is your most valuable asset. And that surprises people. But the stuff which is swimming or growing on your farm is typically worth more than your boats, your nets, your trucks, what have you. Why does that matter? Because if it's a living asset, um, then there is some risk involved. You're dealing with living animals and plants. And because the growth rate on that asset is the growth rate on your largest asset. So on a farm uh, that has relatively small differences in growth rates, uh, think of it as a, two different bank accounts. And one has a 1% growth rate and, or interest rate, and another has a 2% interest rate. So that makes a big difference over a three-year, four-year cycle. That's true for farms. And so one of the things that we're far finding, and one of the reasons that people are prospecting different sites, is to find out how those animals and plants perform on specific sites and pick sites where the growth rates are the best. Time equals risk. The longer your production cycle, the more you are exposed to risk. So if you have a, a, a site or an animal or a plant that has a three-year production cycle versus one that has a one-year production cycle, you have a higher level of risk. Site selection is critical for many, many reasons, and I'm not going to go into it here, but I will just say that one of the things we have learned the hard way in Maine in the early days we picked some sites that turned out to be the bad sites. Um, and the leasing process is long enough and strenuous enough that if you go through the leasing process and you have picked a bad site, it is not a good thing. You have to go back to, to ground zero and start all over again, and that is a long, expensive process. So it is in the farmer's interest, it is in the investor's interest, to make sure that they do tremendous due diligence on a site before they go through the leasing licensing and permitting process. The learning curve is long and steep. Uh, if you have an animal or a plant that has a production cycle of three years, that means you, it takes you nine years to go through three cycles. Okay, so if you come into this sector with no experience and you're planning on learning as you go, um, you will certainly learn, but be prepared for the fact that it takes some time and it may take you more time than you expect. The markets for Maine seafood, and, and certainly Maine aquaculture uh, in particular, are very strong. We are consistently getting paid more than our competitors in the marketplace. There are a number of reasons for that, and one is uh, the temperature of the water we're coming out of. We're coming out of relatively cold water. That gives our products longer shelf life. And 80% of seafood is consumed in restaurants. Anybody here a chef or a restaurant owner? Okay, you know shelf life, what does it translate into? It translates into food cost, right? So uh, if you have stuff which has a longer shelf life, uh, that translates into lower food costs for those, uh, those buyers. Um, the ROI on an aquaculture farm can be quite high. We, uh, I, I will, I'm not gonna name specific companies, but I will say very specifically that I see on well-run farms, it is not unusual to see an ROI of 15 to 25%. So that's not bad. Uh, not bad in, in most markets, frankly. 
Um, having said that, I preface that by saying well-run farms, right? Uh, and that's an important part of it. So if you're investors or bankers, uh, here are some flags to look for. And I have seen these many times over, over the years. I've done a, a lot of financial due diligence. Um, poor site or species selection, somebody comes to you and they pick a site which is not adapted to the species or uh, the kind of production method they're using. Uh, that puts that company inherently at a disadvantage and they're gonna be fighting an uphill battle. Optimistic growth rates, that's a very common mistake. People in their business plans will say, you know, I know I can do it better and my stuff is gonna grow faster than my neighbors. Uh, and maybe they can, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on that. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, this is one which is often not spotted by people, but it is, uh, if you've been in the business for any period of time, you know it's a very important, and that's the size distribution and quality distribution. So when you, this goes back to what I said about we're not growing widgets. Uh, if you're in a, a bolt uh, making factory, you have some quality control and every bolt that comes out is exactly the same. Well, you're dealing with living animals. There is a size distribution of every year class. There is a quality distribution of every year class. And that impacts your price and your yields. So if you end up with a year class that has a lot of downgrades in it, or a year class that has a lot of smaller animals or plants in it than bigger animals and plants in it, that very directly impacts your gross revenues. So if you're financiers or investors, and somebody talks to you about what their yields are gonna be or their, their uh, growth rates are gonna be, ask them what they expect their distribution to be in the year class that they're bringing to market. And uh, this is an area where you can actually make a lot of money or lose a lot of money. Relatively small changes, particularly from a downgrade point of view, if you go from a premium to a select to a standard, uh, the price differences can be quite significant and uh, that can make a big difference to your bottom line. Incorrect mortality assumptions, another common example. Why would mortality be important other than the obvious thing that if it's dead you can't sell it? So if you start with 100 animals or plants and you lose 50 of them, what's happened to the remaining 50? You've just taken all the costs of those original 50 and put them on the remaining 50. So you've essentially doubled the cost of production. So mortality is a very big deal and uh, can make a big deal in terms of the bottom line. Social license issues, can you get permits? Do you have your permits? Those are obvious um, things to look for. Technology cures all. Uh, we have a, a saying in the business that biologists get seduced by the species, engineers get seduced by the, the technology, and business people get seduced by the spreadsheets. Um, and there's a lot of truth in that. I've seen it uh, many times over the years. The point being that if you pick a bad site or if you pick a, the wrong species, um, technology may or may not be a way to overcome that, but nine times out of 10, it's gonna cost you more money. So if somebody comes into your office and says to you, we've got revolutionary technology, which is gonna completely alter the production uh, cycle here, be cautious about that and ask some hard questions about it. Why is it, uh, we have a, uh, an interesting trend right now in aquaculture where people are very, um, interested in, in the technology and are very um, excited about new technologies. Most of the technologies that are being used in aquaculture right now are not new technologies. They've been around for quite a while. They're the latest iteration of those technologies. Um, but if you look back and you come to me and say, I've got uh, a brand new submersible cage design, I can almost guarantee you that I can take you back to 1984 in Norway and show you exactly the same design uh, that was uh, on the drawing boards in Norway at that time. So uh, there are innovations which are happening, particularly around aquatic animal health and feeds. Um, but in terms of some of the production technologies, they're not as new as some people would suggest they are. Uh, high throughput and densities. This is another classic place where investors, I think, get um, duped a little bit. So, you do your business plan and your cost of production is higher than the price in the marketplace. I got a solution for that. I'm gonna put more units through or I'm gonna put more stuff in that tank and therefore I'll produce more. That's often a sign that somebody um, is really pushing the limits of either a technology or a business plan and they're making assumptions that by putting more units through or increasing the densities in those systems uh, that they're gonna change the economics of those systems. What happens when you put more units through or increased densities? You're dealing with a living animal or plant. 
uh, you're increasing risk. Okay, so uh, not to say it, it isn't appropriate. There are, there are certainly situations where that is appropriate, but be aware that when you start to see those numbers creeping up, that's when you have to start asking questions as an investor. Optimistic price assumptions. What I'm doing as a grower is better than what he's doing over there, so I'm going to get paid more for it. Nick is going to probably <laughs> break out laughing. He's an old, he's an old fish dealer. Um, it, it just has not proven to be the case in the marketplace, with, with one exception, which is the main brand. The main brand actually has proved to be uh, resilient and has proved to uh, result in a premium in the marketplace. So that's a, that's a case where that has uh, been an exemption. And unique markets or product forms. A lot of times I'll hear somebody say, I'm going to sell into a market that nobody else is in. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to have either a unique market or I'm going to get a better price. The question is, how big is that market and what is the price elasticity of that market when you begin to put significant pounds into that market. And so a lot of times niche markets sound great, but you can saturate them pretty quickly. If you are a successful aquaculture farmer, you are going to produce tonnage, not pounds, but tonnage. And that oftentimes has an impact in those niche markets. So this is my last, last slide, and it's just my advice that I give new growers that come into my office. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a slide of caution. I'll, I'll be uh, the first person to admit that. Uh, start small. Don't go in and, and start with you know, a gazillion dollars off the bat and, um, and decide that you're going to uh, take over the world. Manage your risks. Be aware of your risks and manage your risks and bed hedge. A great example of bed hedging would be um, if you're a mussel farmer and you have all of your farms in one location, if that location happens to be subject to red tide, you probably want to start thinking about developing a lease site in another location. So if you're shut down in one location, you can mark it from another location. That's a, that's a simple example of bed hedging. Don't try to do too much at once. This is probably one of the most common mistakes I see in our young growers. They get so excited about what they're doing that they're growing mussels, and then they want to grow seaweed, and then they want to grow scallops, and then they want to grow clams, and they begin to lose focus over time. And so my counsel to them is be cautious about adding uh, new species. Focus on your core business and make sure you're doing that well. Doesn't mean you shouldn't experiment, but just don't start to do 30% you know, scallops, 30% mussels, etc. Keep meticulous records. This is really important because you learn from your mistakes. Um, do a budget and production plan and do it conservatively. You would be surprised at how many people start a business, and this is not unique to aquaculture, and they don't have a budget at all. They don't have a budget plan, they don't have a production plan. It always amazes me how many people who have been in business for many years don't actually have a business plan or a production plan. Uh, know your product's costs. A good farmer, if you walk on that farm and you point to a cage or a set of animals and say, how much money have you got into those animals at that time? They should be able to answer that question. If they can't answer that question, that's a flag. Uh, hire good people, living animals again, good people, Take care of animals. They are your shepherds, right? They are the people who take care of your animals and plants. They are the people who will spot a program as it begins to emerge or hopefully before it begins to emerge. So invest in your people, train them, and retain them over time. And then in the seafood business, and again, Nick will laugh about this, manage your receivables and your customers. Uh, seafood as a sector has, uh, because you're selling to restaurants, uh, and my old buddy Dick Groton from the Maine Restaurant Association used to say, restaurants are a unique business. You are as likely to go out of business the next year if you've been in business for 10 years as if you've been in business for one year. Um, so receivables uh, are really important. We have seen a number of young farmers who have been so enthusiastic about selling to somebody that somebody said, I can't pay my bill this week, but you know I'll pay it next week, and it kind of goes on and on and on, and suddenly you're into them for... $25,000, and for a young farmer, that's, that's a death knell. So manage your receivables and manage your customers. These are just pictures of some of the stuff we grow in Maine, and those are some of the folks who grow it. Um, each of those are one of my members in different parts of the state. We even have a tropical fish grower, Soren Hansen, up outside of Ellsworth. Um, he actually uh, he breeds customized color morphs of these uh, clownfish and many other tropical fish, and then he sells them via the internet all over uh, the country. Who would have guessed we had a tropical fish farm in, uh, in Maine? And thank you so much for all your time.